Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar. You can call us that. We won't be too offended. I won't be offended. I've gotten over it. <laughs> gotten over it. Um, that we, we do this uh, live every Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they are recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, it's fine. You can always go to our website and see all of our recordings going back to when we started in January 2009. Um, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions. Basically, um, whatever libraries are doing out there, we want to share it and get it on, on the show and get people um, talking and, and uh, learning about it all. Uh, we have commission uh, staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes present here, our speakers, and we bring in guest speakers. Uh, this morning we have, I guess I call a mixture, because you're going to, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we have a mixture of today. Um, um, once a month we do our Tech Talk with Michael Sowers, who is right next to me here. Hello. Michael Sowers is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And he comes on once a month to talk about the tech news of the month, whatever's come up interesting since the last time he was on. Um, and sometimes bring in speakers, presenters, interviews, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just going to hand over to you to talk about um, who you've brought on to come on uh, the show with us. All right. Morning. All right. Thanks, Krista. Um, today's Tech Talk is going to be a little different. Um, and uh, please excuse, I've got to say this part at least once. We're going to get a little crafty today. They started uh, they, it. They yeah, I encourage them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, to, we're we're going to have two guests today, one of which is definitely tech-oriented, one of which isn't, but... Um, I kind of threw them together anyways. Um, our, our first guest that we'll, we'll have here in a moment is Gordon Wyant from the Bellevue Public Library. Um, I saw either an article or an email or something come across one of our mailing lists uh, a while back that said that they had set up their own Minecraft server. So a little gaming uh, and a little tech to, to run that. And so we're going to have Gordon talking about what uh, he is doing there at Bellevue with that. And that's definitely the tech half of today's show. The uh, somewhat related uh, but not as technical in the, the gaming area is uh, Lindsay Tomsu from La Vista Public Library, who was just on the show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have brought her back because she's doing some live action gaming uh, featuring HP Lovecraft stories, which is why I have my Cthulhu puppet here uh, in, for those of you watching the video today. So um, we've got some Minecraft and we've got some Lovecraft going on today. So that's that, that, there's our craft. So they're related yes. for the, they are, the team gaming. The, yep, and, and team gaming and just gaming in general. Uh, some tech, some, some high tech, some low tech. So uh, Gordon, you are on the line with us uh, there. Okay. All right. Uh, Hello, we're, everybody. We're, yep, we're going to go ahead and just... Uh, give you control and as uh, Krista mentioned before we got the recording going if you've got questions for either of our uh, speakers today just go ahead and send them in through the Q&A and we will uh, happily pass those along as time okay goes. and there you go Gordon off you go yeah we're seeing your screen looks good all right is there a way to make this smaller let's see here all right well we'll just I'll just go with it I just made that bigger that's not what I was trying to do okay um, all right. Well, as um, Michael mentioned, we've been playing around with some Minecraft stuff. Uh, those of you who don't know what Minecraft is, it's a, a game that's created by a programmer named Notch from out in, oh, geez, I don't know, the Netherlands, something like that. Anyway, it's been out technically since 2009. It started in the alpha stages, and you can get in on it for free or for relatively cheap. And it's a Java-based game that's what's called a, a sandbox game. Basically, it gives you an entire world that you can play with, you can destroy, you can build, you can fight little creatures. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it doesn't look like all that much. Um, here's, we're on the, our, the library server currently. You can kind of see what it looks like. I just recently had to restart it because they, they had a new, I'm being followed by a horde of ducks. This is rather frightening, actually. Um, anyway, it's it's rather blocky, but you can you can destroy blocks, you can put blocks down, create things. I'm just going to create a little box here, just kind of show you what you can do. Um, and uh, over here in the distance, you can see there's somebody's created a town. Um, so you you can just build stuff, have fun, destroy things. At nighttime. Um, 
monsters come out and attack you and try to destroy what you made and uh, kill you, which is always fun. Um, but that's, that's basically Minecraft. Uh, it's, it's very simple, open world where you can build whatever you want, do whatever you want um, as, well, mine and, and craft, basically. There you go. That's about the, the name sums it up, essentially. Um, it's, it's become a big deal in the gaming world. Um, pretty much everybody is playing it, either on their computer, their Xbox, their tablets even. You can play it on your iPad. There's a, there's a mobile version of it. Um, it's pretty incredible. As you can see on the, the Minecraft website, they've got a little ticker. That I don't know how accurate it is, but it's probably pretty, pretty accurate as far as how many people are, are currently playing the game. Um, it really has blown up into this immense um, community-driven miracle game, essentially. I mean, it, there's no big, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no big publishing house behind them. There's no big programming house. It's just one guy and a couple of his friends, and, and they've created this thing that, uh, that has basically taken over the gaming world. Um, as I've been a huge fan of Minecraft for a long time, I've been trying to figure out ways to bring it into um, team programming. Um, and I hadn't really found a good way to do it due to our restrictions on our, our, the computers that we have at the library, um, things of that sort. Um, made it difficult to do that. But I recently was awarded a grant through the um, Nebraska Library Commission's Excellence in Youth Service to get some 3D printers. And I thought it would be a great way to incorporate Minecraft and also um, be an introduction into how to create things in a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional world, which is what the teens will need to be doing when they create models in Blender or 3D Max or SketchUp in order to to export those models into a, uh, a format that 3D printers can print. Um, so I decided Minecraft would be perfect for that. So we we bought some some uh, that's what I'm looking for some some uh, copies of Minecraft for the the laptops that we'll be using and. Uh, and in order to kind of celebrate all this, we had a big Minecraft-a-thon event um, where we, we had a lot of crafts going on. We had, uh, like, you know, perler bead crafts, you know, the little fuse beads, which Minecraft clearly works really well for that. And, uh, and um, we did some paper craft stuff. Um, here's, we had a big, huge um, area set up with these little QB craft boxes that you kind of fold together and glue. Um, I put like magnets on the inside of them. We had a whole bunch of these spread out. And people could make their own little Minecraft world. And of course, we had Minecraft going on, on a server that, that, that we have. Um, it's, it's very easy to set up a Minecraft server for yourself. Um, and on your own, you just download the, the server app um, and just run it. And it's very, very simple. It just brings it up. There you go. Your uh, server is up. And then all you have to do is, is uh, um, give your, your IP address to your friends, all your, your, your um, pages. It's like mine's, mine's freaking out here. So I'm going to close that up. Um, now, so you can just run it with that, and now it's it's not closing. Here, there we go. Come on, close. There we go. Um, but there there are some some limitations into that. I mean, you're going to have to have a, a decent computer running it, um, something that has a, a decent GPU, a decent uh, CPU. Uh, you do want multi-core on that, and uh, and you're going to have ideally you're going to have it up the whole time, and you're going to need to do some 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 maintenance on and off about you know restarting the server um, if it gets clogged if it if it gets bogged down somehow um, which didn't really work for us so I looked around for some options in terms of um, actually having a a host server and I, I came across this group Minecraft Server .net 
which uh, was relatively cheap. Um, you could buy, you know, they've got a variety of of a variety of plans that you can go with, um, with you know various pricing things, and you can you get discounts on, uh, you know, doing doing multiple groups and uh, or multiple months, um, and you can see you could get more people bought into your. So like which has 40 slots, that's 40 people that can log into your server. 60 slots, 60 people can log into your server. And the price is, is based on that. Um, and that worked well for us. Once you log in there, you can, you can go to your, your um, actual control the server from their little multi-craft, uh, which is a server control program, um, from your, directly from their, their little web app. You can access the console and you know do changes through the console. Um, you can modify, you know, take a look at the players. You can click on them and decide what you know their default role is, whether they're banned or not, things of that sort. You can see when they're the last time they logged in, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it's it's it works. It worked really well for us because it meant we could have it up going up all the time, and we didn't have to depend on. On, um, we didn't have to depend on um, one of our computers being up the whole time. Um, it allowed me to to focus on the uh, the event itself, and uh, and have a lot of fun with it. Now, a lot of people have that's kind of what we did for for the server for for our Minecraftathon. We've left it up the whole time. One of our um, our Library clerks was really excited about it and donated some money to to keep the the server running. So the server we've left up and people have been using it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, we've put it in with our Facebook. You can see the Minecraft IP addresses there. If anybody wants to jump on to the library server that we have at any point in time, the the IP is right there on our Facebook. Just Bellevue Public Library. You can take a look at it. I recently ran into some troubles with it and I had to reset the world so you can't see all the amazing things that everybody had built before I had to reset the world but you can get in there and kind of see what it's like and join in on the fun. Um, because Minecraft is such a unique thing um, with the things it can do and 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 all those those great stuff it has a distinctly um, educational um, feel to it, so you can do. There, there have been some people that have licensed with the Minecraft people to sell um, copies of Minecraft at a discount, um, up to fifty percent off of the full price, which is a pretty big deal. Um, a copy of Minecraft costs about twenty-seven dollars, um, which is really cool. Um, and, uh, however, that, that they've got that discount. However, in order to get the discount, um, you have to buy it in classroom sets. Um, and you basically the, the catch there is that they have developed a, um, a server program for Minecraft that helps teachers do things that you could do with the server just on its own if you took a little time to read through it, um, the Minecraft EDU custom mod. Which they pay forty-one dollars for is just uh, they have have it set up for you already, which means you don't have to go in and 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 mess with it yourself. But it's all things that you could do on your own um, if it just took a little bit of time to to set up. Um, so that's kind of the catch for getting the discount is that you have to buy their their puffed up piece of of uh, server mod that really you can do on your own. But you can do some really amazing stuff um, with Minecraft. People have used it for uh, geometry. People have used it for, for history stuff. They've used it for, um, let's see the word I'm looking for, um, architecture. Um, it's really great for teaching people to, to think um, critically in a three-dimensional world which is, is really, really cool. Um, just some things that people have done 
that are really incredible. Um, people, this whole big thing here that you see here on, on YouTube is a is a, a calculator within the Minecraft world. I'll skip ahead a bit. You can see him inputting stuff onto the, the keypad and it will it will output put answers in real time, which is, is really cool. It's just this immense huge programming thing. Think of uh, the old school like punch cards, uh, computers, and that's basically what that is. Um, somebody's made a 3D printer, which I think is very cool, considering that's, you know, what we're, we're using the, uh, um, the Minecraft 4 is to give people a leg up into creating things in a three-dimensional world. You can kind of see how he's, he's sped it up, and you can see how he's punched the design in, and now his gigantic city-sized Minecraft creation is creating Minecraft creations itself. Uh, so there's all kinds of amazing things that you can do with that, and incredibly epic things you can do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's, there's quite a few here. Let me, let me open it back up. It's massive. Oh, yeah. that's the, this one right here. You can see him walking through the, the decks. Let's... And uh, so, Gordon, so, are, was was that actually? So, like and, something and here's just something they did that's this massive. Gordon, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, w was that like somebody yeah, recreated yeah. Doom in Minecraft? Is is that what you were just showing us? <laughs> no, what I what I was oh. trying to show you, and and I didn't have it on mute, and the guy on YouTube was talking, and I thought it was you talking. Oh, <laughs> so that's why I shut up no. for a bit. And no, this is actually a mega object where somebody made the Star Trek Enterprise. Oh, wow. So you can make anything in Minecraft. This thing is one to one scale. It's so it's it's absolutely huge. Um, so you can really make anything in Minecraft given the time and the um, sort of the patience and the sheer fortitude. <laughs> you can build absolutely anything. Um, you can construct. You can. There's people who have constructed to scale operating like actual functional New York subway systems. Well, as functional as a New York subway system is at any given moment. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, things of this sort that you can just do amazing, amazing things with um, such a simple program. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, so but yeah, people have done, I'm sure people have done a, a, to scale doom, it would not surprise me at all. Um, if well, you just do a search, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, here's my next. I mean, I I have never played Minecraft, so 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 here's my next question because you mentioned the um, the 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 monsters that come out at night. Yep. Okay. Somebody spends all that time to to build the Enterprise, and I can I can just kind of guess as to to what sort of effort that would take. Um, do monsters come in and undo your work? I mean, what, how, how does that work? Or yes and no. Um, okay. You have a variety of, of game modes within Minecraft. Ah, okay. You have, uh, you have survival, which is what the default game mode is set to whenever you start a game, whenever you start a server. Um, and, and in that mode, uh, monsters show up and they will attack you if they see you. Um, the ways that your, your creations get destroyed by monsters is there is a, a uh, here, let me um, back out of the way here so I can make another one here. Um, um, there is a, a monster called the Creeper, um, which is this cute little guy right here. And what he does is when he sees you, he follows you, and if he gets close enough to you, he'll explode. Now, if you are in your little house that you made, and he saw you, and he can get inside it or somewhere near it, and explodes, well, he will destroy some of what you've created. 
that is probably the most often way that things are destroyed in in in, in the game. Um, however, uh, another mode which is creative, the monsters will spawn, but they won't actually attack you. They won't respond to you. They'll just kind of sit there. So you can walk up to a creeper and, and say hello, and he he won't he won't attack. You can you can make friends with creepers. This is not actual actually real in this little picture, but but I mean basically everybody's friendly with the monsters in creative mode, um, which is nice and fun um, because then you can create things and you don't have to worry about it, um, and you can set your own you can set a single player game to creative mode. Um, so things won't attack you. You can set it to survival, so they will attack you. Um, but uh, the servers, you can control what the default game mode is um, and set it to that. So currently, the library's um, server is set to to um, is set to to creative, so people can create things without worrying about you know, a creeper coming up and destroying it. That said, there are other ways that your creations can be destroyed. Um, as you can see in this, this video that's running right now from the, uh, the Nerdfighters official um, Minecraft server called Nerdcraft Area, um, it is raining. Well, you also get thunderstorms, and sometimes your wooden tree houses or, or your, your wooden creations might be struck by lightning, in which case fire starts, and, and it's horrible and, and terrible and, and sad and kind of fun at the same time, um, trying to put out the fire. Uh, so yes, your, your, some of your creations can be destroyed. It's just kind of part of the world. Um, however, there are certain blocks, certain building materials that are, are more durable than others. For example, stone is going to be more durable than wood if lightning strikes stone, it's not going to catch on fire, it, you know, you might lose a couple blocks and you have to rebuild that, the couple blocks, but it, for the most part it, it's not a big deal. Um, but that's really the only real ways that, that things can be destroyed um, within the, the Minecraft world. Um, so yeah, you basically set in creative mode, you don't really have to worry about too much about things being destroyed or, or unmade, um, except by other people, which uh, is something that that you kind of have to set in your rules of the server to, you know, don't be a mean person and, and destroy other people's stuff or, or you get banned kind of thing. In fact, um, I have something of the, uh, oh, my, that's not working because of what we're running. Um, let's see if I can get to it. Here. I don't believe I can. All right. Um, but um, on our server, I have on the welcome board, which is right where any new player will spawn, I have a little sign that just basically says be nice. Um, And uh, basically, don't be a douchebag, um, <laughs> which is generally a good rule. Um, oh, as you can see, there's a there's a little monster, but since we're on creative mode, he's not going to attack me. Um, hey there, be nice, be creative, have fun, um, and that's just a general rule for things. Um, if you aren't nice, then uh, then we'll and you start destroying people's stuff, like I'm destroying here, except I just built that to show you how things are built, so that's okay. Um, and I find out about it, then I can, I can ban you or, or limit you in terms of what you can do. Um, so, so yeah, that's something that you kind of have to control, and it's, it's one reason why you kind of want to have um, people that you, that you trust that you can also allowed to be a mod or an admin so that they can take care of things when you aren't around. Because um, you can't be on the server 24-7. It just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, so, oh, and it's raining. And uh, so, so yeah, that's, that, that is something that, that you do have to deal with 
even on creative mode. Um, and, it, and that can be frustrating and aggravating. Um, griefing is, is the common word for it. Um, and, uh, and it's unfortunate when that happens. Um, and you just, it, you, there's no, there's no in-game checks to prevent that from happening. That's something that you have to manage on your own. Um, but anyway, so that's, um, that's Minecraft. Um, I'm gonna, I need to turn this down because if somebody asks something, I know I'm not gonna hear them. Okay. Um. Okay, I, I just, uh, be, before we switch over to Lindsay, I, I have one more question that, and, and if, if, feel, feel free to um, consider this a completely unfair question and correct me. Um, what if I was to say this just looks like an 8-bit version of Second Life? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, the, well, the graphics are about the same. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, Second Life being, what, 10 years old now? Um, yeah, it's, it's, graphics are not, are not great, but what it makes up for in, in actual graphics, it, um, had, what, it, what it lacks in graphics it makes up for in terms of the sheer size of the world. The world is absolutely huge, um, and, and as I said, you can, you can create it. I mean, the world is not just what you see on the surface. You can, as the, uh, as the the um, the name implies, you can you can mine, and uh, um, here let me see if I can. Right, there's some other. I don't think the redstone torch will work. But anyway, the you can mine incredibly far down. In fact, we're just going to dig a, a giant hole just to show you how far down it can go. Not that you will be able to see much, because it's nighttime and it's very dark. Um, Put up a torch. <laughs> so um, as you can see, I've dug so far down that, that it's, uh, here, let me fly out if I can. Did I just, there we go. So like I dug very far down and, and the world is massively huge. Uh, now the, the world of Second Life is very huge too, but um, the world in Second Life isn't completely malleable and changeable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is in a sense, but but um, not in the same the same way that that Minecraft is. I mean, you can. Oh wow, there's a big hole in the world. It's not catching up here. Um, in the sense that that in Minecraft you can you can immediately change things. Like right here, I'm just breaking up breaking up the, the world and, uh, and rebuilding it as I see fit, just right now. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the big difference. Um, because of how huge the world is and how every piece of it can be manipulated, destroyed, built, um, rebuilt, and, and turned into something new, um, that's, that's where the bulk of the, the processing power and, uh, and the actual well, not the, you know, where the actual like, like meat and the of the game comes from and goes to. I hope that answered your question. I don't know if, if that really. Yeah, Gordon, really did this or not. this is Krista. I I would compare it more not to Second Life. Second Life is where it's their game, their look, their servers. You log into their world and do it. Minecraft, I would compare more to SimCity. because you have your own copy of it. You're not you you don't go here and walk next door and there's someone else's. Um, place that they built, unless you, know, you guys are sharing a server, yes. But um, yeah, if, if if it's all on the same server, yeah, it's right. all in the same but, world. But like and, we have it at our house, and um, I we have it, per I have it personally. <laughs> and you're not in another a place that someone else has created. You just have your own blank slate, and it's your own thing to do something with. Um, ours on our computers is ours. Um, mine on my computer is different than the one on the laptop that we have, um, and different from my friends down the street. Um, so it's more similar to, I think, a SimCity, except it's even more creative because you create everything from scratch. You don't like pick a house and build it. It's a blank slate completely. You got to mine. You got to find your wood. You got to dig up your your rock and create the items. And yeah. 
No, yeah, in terms of in terms of single player, yeah. Um, yeah. In multiplayer, you you log onto a server and you you share that server with everybody right. that is on the server or has access to the server at any given time. Um, but yeah, single player, it's it's your own world. Um, every time you create a, a game, it will it will create a, a entirely different world. It will always be different. It randomly generates the terrain, which sometimes leads to interesting things like this floating block of dirt that I just found. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's yeah, it's oh, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, All right. I, I hope that kind of answers questions for you. Um, really, um, in terms of doing it for your own library, I think I mean unless unless you're you are able to get around your um, your um, your library's um, computer security policies, your city's computer security policies, um, making your own uh, um, making your own server is probably not going to work the best. Um, you may need to to look into to um, getting a, a server hosting like company um, like we did um, which depending on the you know the amount of of people you think are going to participate um, can dictate how much you spend um, and uh, and they're, they're pretty flexible in in that um, but honestly the cheapest way is to to just have your own server and it's super easy to do you just go to the uh, the minecraft site and uh, and you can download your um, uh, Gordon, we have one quick question yeah, about it. Where it is in there. But, yep. Um, which is, I know the answer, but I'll let you. Um, when you encounter an animal on the screen, is it one that your patrons have created, or are they coming from other servers or other players? Oh, the creatures are spawned. Um, the, the, the world spawns them themselves. However, you can, in a sense, create your own. Like here, I've got this horde of ducks following me because I have some seeds out. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is use the seeds on them, and they get those little heart things. And I'm going to use seeds on another one, and you see they fall in love, and they poop out a baby duck. So in a sense, you can make your own animals. Um, okay. Or, I guess the chicken, <laughs> but you've got to find the but, ones that are just created by the game itself to start yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and with the new patch, there's horses. There's horses now, guys. There's you horses. Can, you can ride horses. So, yes, we have one. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can put a saddle on a horse and ride it, and it's really cool. So, um, so that's really neat. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to finally have horses. It very much excited me. Um, <laughs> I've, so, I've, always, I've always said when people ask why I don't game more is because I would game more. Uh, and so I, I kind of consciously keep myself away from things like this because I could see it totally sucking me in and not getting anything else done. Oh, yeah. Minecraft does have a way of becoming a black hole um, <laughs> where you, you start building something. And uh, I mean, whether you're on a, a server or your own single player, it it absorbs time like nothing else. Um, World of Warcraft has nothing on Minecraft in terms of destroying lives. <laughs> Through sheer, just all you do is is spend your time playing the game. Um, but uh, but it's a lot of fun, um, and it it brings communities together, um, building various things. Like for example, the the Minecraft area, where I'm just going to show you some of the, I had that running for a bit, um, some of the amazing things that they've built. And of course, the, the Nerd Fighter group is, is pretty amazing to begin with. But there's a, a big, uh, they decided to build Hogwarts, which they're in the process of doing in this video. Um, so you get a bunch of like-minded individuals um, in the community, which Minecraft is, is great about creating. And and you can build incredible things, amazing things, and uh, and uh, it's just a, a lot of fun, and it, it works. I think it's it's ideal for library programs, for school programs, um, for just groups of friends, um, because of that community-oriented nature of it. Um, it's a lot of fun, and and uh, you can build things together, design things together, and if you are doing something like a makerspace that involves you know, CNC routers or, or 3D printers or, you know, laser cutting even, it, it's, 
a great tool in, in allowing people that are entirely new to uh, creating three-dimensional objects in order to start thinking critically in a three-dimensional world and, and creating things in a, a three-dimensional world. Um, all right. So yes, yeah, I. I <laughs> Thank, Sorry, thank, go ahead. Thank, yeah, thanks a lot, Gore. I think in the in the interest of time, uh, yeah. we're gonna. I, I think we've got one or two questions. We're gonna hold them off just for now. And uh, thank you very much for that. If if any more questions come in at the end, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. So um, our our next guest is is Lindsay Thomas here from uh, La Vista Public Library. Uh, Lindsay, are you there? Oh nope, not yet. Hold on. Uh, I think you just unmuted Loretta. We don't want to do that. Lindsay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. And uh, have we switched over control there? Yes, okay, uh, Lindsay's been doing some uh, fun stuff with live action gaming and HP Lovecraft. So, uh, Lindsay, why don't you go ahead and uh, let us know what you've been doing there. Yep, looks good. Go. Yep, we see your slides. Okay, the little blobby thing was kind of in the way. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. Basically, uh, our life size Arkham Horror was a project that ended up coming about because of our Arkham Horror Gaming Club. And so I've got a picture here. This is basically what the base board of Arkham looks like. And essentially it is a what I like to call a complex board game because it involves more than just, you know, normal gaming in a library where you set up the Wii or the Xbox and then the teams go at it. Yeah, there's lots of reading, critical thinking, teamwork, mathematical skills, you know, going on in these types of board games. And so Arkham Horror happens to be based off of the short stories of H.P. Lovecraft and his Cthulhu mythos and everything. And the basic gist behind Arkham is that everybody is an investigator with their own unique abilities and skills, and they work together to stop monsters from spawning in these different locations throughout Arkham and from portals opening to other worlds and more monsters pouring out. And if you don't succeed in killing all the monsters and closing all the portals, one of these massive monsters called an Ancient One will awaken, and they're about 50 times harder to kill than a normal little monster that's Roman Arkham. So, so it's a very teamwork-based game and everything. And um, Gordon and I actually introduced my teen advisory board to it at our very first teen advisory board lock-in back in uh, 2011. And they just took to it like crazy because they'd never seen any type of game like this before. And so they, they really enjoyed it. And they were asking me, you know, throughout the school year, when are we going to get to play it again? When are we going to get to play it again? And because these games are so intricate, they unfortunately tend to be rather expensive. The baseboard for Arkham itself is about $80. And so um, I told them about the Commission's Youth Excellence Grant, and so we ended up uh, applying for one of them to start our Arkham Horror Gaming Club, which essentially got us three baseboards, one each of all the expansions, and then some related games as well. And so we started you know, playing it and everything, and I got a few you know, pictures. You know, in the beginning, you know, uh, we basically ended up in spring break of 2000. 12, we ended up uh, having all the materials and everything and basically sat down at the library from 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. to get everybody oriented to the game and you know, help them learn the rules and stuff because since these are complex games, an average game can take six to eight hours to play. So we've got some you know, pictures here. You can see you know, how intricate and everything it is to learn everything. Um, one actual baseboard can play eight people at a time, so we we have enough in our club to accommodate 50 people at one time, and so uh, they just really really loved it. And during the school year, we have a club meeting every Saturday by monthly, and then during the summer we have it monthly, so that they can come and play and have fun and eat snacks, and yeah, you know, they just really really enjoy it. So last summer, the uh, uh, teen Read Week grant through Yalza and Dollar General was coming up and I sat down with my teens and I told them about the grant and everything 
uh, I sat down with them on a Thursday, and the grant was actually due on that Sunday. <laughs> and I said, you know, hey, it's a thousand dollar grant. We had received Yelza's uh, summer reading program grants before in the past, and I was like, this is a a thousand dollar grant to do one big thing for Teen Read Week, not to spread it over the summer or anything like that. And I said, you know, does anybody have any ideas? Because the theme last year for Teen Read Week was it came from the library, so it was kind of spooky and everything. And our summer reading program last year was, you know, supernatural, you know. And so we were like, we can come up with something. And so everybody kind of unanimously agreed we should do something related to Arkham and HP Lovecraft. And they thought up, you know, just different ideas like, oh, we could make Miskatonic University t-shirts. We could do our own character creation workshop. Yes, yeah, so we have our own character. Like, we can insert the doctor as a character into the Arkham world, you know, things like that. And um, then one of my girls, Sarah, ended up having an insane idea. And she just raised her hand and said, the other summer we did a life-size candy land for the kids. Could we make Arkham life-size? And everybody was like, yes, that is the best idea in the world. <laughs> so, so we sat down, and I wrote the grants, you know, to make this huge Lovecraft festivities. You know, we, we incorporated our other ideas, and then it would all culminate in the life-size version of the game. And so basically the tab, you know, they promised that, because we usually don't start school year programming until October, so we were going to find out if we got the grant last August. So I said, you guys have to promise to dedicate your time to volunteer to make sure that if we get the grant, it turns out as awesome as it possibly could. And so they did. And so from the end of August until the middle of October, when Teen Read Week came around, we were working nonstop to have this program basically happen. So for preparation and everything, we had to think up a lot of things. There was one whole week where we spent doing nothing but brainstorming. We just sat down in front of the game board, looked at it, and we had to think about things like, how do we make the locations 3D enough? And there are 26 locations in Arkham that we had to make life-size. We had to think about how to make the cards and the tokens in the game life-size. We had to think about how to do the monsters. In the base board, there are 60 different monsters that we would have to make props of, essentially. Uh, all the teens wanted to make costumes for this, their favorite characters that they liked to play. We had to think of other kinds of, you know, props that we would need, you know. We also sat down, and when we thought of props, you know, how many uh, you know, of them could be donated, you know, like, oh, Sarah's got this that she can bring for this scene, or Kayla's got that, and she can bring that, you know, and we can use that. And then we had to sit down and think of all the non-donated items that we'd have to purchase to make this happen and how much that would cost. So there was lots and lots of brainstorming going on. Uh, here's some just you know, pre-prep photos. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the grant was that Fantasy Flight, the creators of Arkham Horror, they are actually located in Roseville, Minnesota, which is only five hours away. So I said that we would actually contact them and invite them to our event. Unfortunately, last year it was going on at the same time that they do their Arkham Nights at their headquarters, which is like a three-day weekend of people coming to play Arkham and everything. So in lieu of that, that top picture on the left, they sent us about $300 worth of merchandise and stuff to use in our gaming club, to give away as prizes, all that kind of stuff, and also have enthusiastically said, if you need anything else, let us know, and when you do it again, we want to come. <laughs> so they're very excited about it. Uh, the bottom picture there is just an example of some of the props and everything we started buying. The great thing about it was that Teen Read Week is in October, and so we had Halloween right around the corner. So a horror-themed game was perfect for actually buying props that you couldn't find in, say, April. <laughs> so uh, basically, one of the biggest things that we had in preparation was uh, the portals, that when a portal opens up in a location, it sucks you through, you go do some stuff over in that location, pop back through an Arkham, and then get to close the portal. So our biggest idea, there are eight portals in the game, and um, they're all along one side of the game board. So we thought what we would do is actually paint six-foot-tall murals of all eight of the portals. So that was about two weeks' worth of time there and everything. So you can see some of my teams you know, in the bottom corner you know, painting you know, some of the examples of our portals going on there. Uh, this was actually probably one of the 
favorite activities among a lot of the teens because they got to be super creative. They got to look at these tiny pictures of the portal and try to make them, you know, six foot versions, you know, but they had lots of fun painting and everything. And it was great. And our intention was that these portals could be hung on our large meeting room wall. And so if you were in a portal, you could stand right in front of the picture of the portal that you were in. Uh, another big thing that took up a lot of preparation time was how to do all the monsters. So it was very, very easy for the monsters that are human-like. So witches, warlocks cultists here, you see zombies, you know, things like that. So we had a bunch of Barbies left over from when we did zombie Barbies, so we utilized those to turn them into monsters and everything. Uh, some of the other monsters that are more creepy, you know, looking, took a little bit more effort and concentration. And so you can see on the right here is we went and bought a bunch of dollar store stuffed animals that we thought we could turn into things. Luckily, at the time, they had a bunch of hanging monkeys. So, so we bought a ton of monkeys, chopped off their arms and legs to make tentacles on other monsters, things like that. Uh, the picture on the left is probably everybody's favorite monster. One of my girls, Katie, she ended up taking the little dinosaur, cutting open its mouth, and then gluing a bunch of toothpicks randomly to make these horrible, jagged teeth of the Hound of Tindalos. And so he, he, the real monster is not as cute as that guy. <laughs> so they had lots of fun being creative and trying to figure out how to make these you know, life-size you know, monsters that they could end up fighting and you know, keeping during gameplay as their little monster trophies if they defeated them. Uh, here's another example of a little cardboard tube guy, the Chthonian, you know, and this guy over here. He's supposed to be a multi-tentacled, multi-eyed little sugar guy. So had lots of them, and we did make 60 actual monsters, you know, from the baseboard. Uh, another big thing that we had to think about was how to make the cards and the tokens life-size. This was probably the most, the element that was the most plain busy work, essentially. I, um, since the baseboard, each location only comes with like seven actual cards, and when you're thinking about playing with 20-some people in a life-size version, I pulled all the location cards from all the expansions and everything, so that's why in the bottom photo you can see that the red deck is pretty thick, you know, the black deck's pretty thick, you know, so that that way we weren't having, you know, the same card drawn over and over and over. So. We actually used all the cards from all the expansions and everything. And so basically what I did was I just went to the Arkham Horror Wiki. I took the photos of each card, enlarged them, printed them out. Then we basically had to spend time getting the corresponding construction paper color, taping the fronts to the fronts, taping the backs to the backs, laminating it, and then recutting them all out. So, so it, was, it was a lot of work. You can see Haley and Sarah there, you know, taping stuff down. Uh, luckily, a number of our circulation clerks, you know, volunteered to help with the laminating and the cutting, you know, so that was a huge help. But they're laminated. They're all good to go. You know, they're great because we can keep them, reuse them, you know, every time that we want to redo this. So very, very awesome. Um, so the setup, basically, we have a pretty big, large meeting room. And so uh, the event was going to be held on a Saturday. But because we knew it was going to take forever to set up and possibly to take down, we reserved the room for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. One of my girls is actually already graduated from high school. So she came in on Thursday. And we basically spent the entire Thursday setting the room up. Here's some pictures of pretty much all the props we've accumulated you know, through the grant, you know, all the stuff that was also donated from my teens, from you know my own mom, yeah, you know, things that we could use, you know, at the at the time, you know, to make our scenes more realistic. So we had lots of stuff to set up. So essentially, what we did was uh, we had printed out images of all the different locations throughout Arkham. We made street signs and everything, and we kind of looked at how large our room was and kind of set them up accordingly to the game board, and then we just started, you know put in all the props where we wanted them to go. And so you see Audie down there, she's taping down, you know, the street locations to the floor so they won't move around. Uh, start, you know, moving all the props to where they're going. Yeah, more examples. You can see how we hung the portals on the back wall, which the portals were probably the hardest part about the setup because they fell down about three times. And that was even with using heavy-duty book tape lathered on the wall. So, so we've learned our lesson that next time we do this, they will go up the morning of the event so that we don't have to deal with eight, six-foot paintings stuck together. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was it was very awesome, you know, and, and you know, we were able to actually set everything up. Uh, I had at the front of the room a you know two very large tables that was kind of like my game master setup because I was basically running everything so that the teams didn't have to come up, draw a card, you know, run back, forget where they were, you know, that kind of thing. So the picture in the bottom is all our cards laid out and everything. The picture in the top shows their investigator sheets. So um, so that we can make it a little bit easier, everybody, you know automatically told me ahead of time, this is the character I want to be, this is the one I'm going to end up dressing up as, and I pre-drew all of their, you know, skills, their weapons, all the props that they would end up having, you know, and so that way when they showed up on the Saturday, we could just go straight into the gameplay. And that's, that's, the props is probably one of the biggest things that we spent the grant money on. So, you know, we've got little knives, you know, little Tommy guns for a gangster, you know, th things like that. And because it was Halloween, we were actually able to find pretty much everything that we needed, which was just great. Uh, some more pictures of kind of like the finalized. Uh, you can see that the bottom corner was as best as I could get a whole picture of the room, which was very, very hard. Um, to show the direction that people were supposed to move, we got skinny masking tape and you know, made taped lines like on the game board but on the floor and so you know they'd be able to tell where they could move and everything. Uh, some close-ups of some of our favorite locations. Like I said there were 26 of them. So on the left you can see what we did to create a science lab. Uh, that's Steve the Skeleton. He was one of our most expensive props that we were like if we could have everything we wanted to do what would we want? And he was an $80 fully articulated skeleton. <laughs> so he's in our little science lab there. We got you know, flasks. Yeah, you know, I printed it, found weird scientific charts that we laminated and printed out. You got bones, got a lab coat with blood on it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the picture on the right is the general store. Uh, lots of people donated you know, jars and stuff like that. I had one uh, neighbor who goes through wine like crazy, so he was collecting wine bottles for us to put freaky Halloween labels on, so they were odd uh, potions and witches brew and stuff like that. Uh, down here in the bottom is our river docks that we were so proud of, because one of my girls, her grandparents have tons of wooden pallets, and we were like, that would make a perfect river dock. So we got little fishies floating around and all that stuff. Up here is the curiosity shop. So. Weird Halloween decorations. You can see our rat poison, you know, spiders, skulls of various sizes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this one on the left here is the newspaper area. So printed out a lot of, you know, weird headlines, stuff like that. And then on the right is the Arkham Insane Asylum. Our other biggest splurge prop was an actual straight jacket costume because our idea was if a character goes insane, they have to go to the insane asylum to get their sanity back. So throughout the game, if anybody went insane, they had to go there, sit there, and actually put on the straight jacket while they waited to gain their sanity back, which was a very fun distraction that everybody loved doing. It was the first time I'd ever seen anybody actually want to go insane in the game because they all wanted to wear the straight jacket. <laughs> Ah, uh, here's Hibbs Roadhouse. It's a very fancy restaurant. So yeah, those are doggy squeaky toys, you know, for the food. <laughs> you know? And then the train station. One of my girls' dad had an actual train, so he let us borrow it to make an actual little train. And then the character cosplay. Like I said, everybody already knew who they wanted to play, and they, you know, did an awesome job dressing up like their characters, and so I've got a few pictures of just some of my favorites. On the left here is Mary. Her character is Diana, who is a reformed cultist, and so uh, very, very cute. Sarah's on the right there. Her character is Ursula, who happens to be a very brainy scientific explorer girl. Then we've got Pierre on the left. He's Wilson, who's just a handyman. And then the highlight, of course, was Elliot on the right, who specifically begged his mother to shave his head for the part so that she could paint weird tribal type designs and everything. He happens to play a shaman character, and so he he his was hands down the winner of <laughs> best dressed. And then there's Haley there. Her favorite character is Monterey Jack. He's an archaeologist and. Her pose is exactly like the photo on the investigator card for him. It was it was awesome. The other picture on this slide happens to show um, 
our terror track, which essentially, you know, the more the town gets scared and everything, it goes up and up, and then shops start closing, and you can't go there anymore. And then the little card with a creepy-looking eyeball -y blob thing is Avisoff, who was the monster, the ancient one that we were attempting not to awaken. And he was the easiest one to do for a life-size version, because if he wakes up, everybody's automatically dead. There is no attempt to fight to him. <laughs> he just devours the world, essentially. So lastly, I've got just some pictures of our actual gameplay and everything. Uh, top right corner, we've got Quinian, who got sent to jail and had to wear the prisoner's outfit, so she's sad. <laughs> Down in the bottom is Kayla, literally following the roads by crawling under the table. Yeah, they, they had lots of fun doing everything. We got big, you know, like, uh, not fuzzy dice, but same size as fuzzy dice, you know, to roll for all our, you know, encounters and stuff like that. You see a big group picture here of everybody in their locations doing their stuff. Down here, Sarah's examining Becca with some of our medical implements. <laughs> Uh, there's Abby with brains of the science building, and Elliot dressed up in the straight jacket. Uh, basically, uh, the life-size version was, you know, pretty, pretty intense. Obviously, in total, uh, over those two and a half months of preparation, my teams volunteered nearly 353 hours to make this actually happen. And to them. It wasn't work. It was absolute fun. They enjoyed everything. The great thing about it is when we do it again, we don't have to redo half of that work that we were doing. You know, it's mainly just set up and play again. Uh, there were, you know, a few complications that we know better now. Uh, obviously, one of the big things is taking an eight-player game to a 20-player life-size game. We were not getting enough monsters appearing on the board, so like we could literally go an hour and a half before another monster would appear. Another thing that we would end up doing is tweaking the rules a little bit to have, uh, we're going to have the teams next time, instead of playing individually, they're going to play in groups of three to four, so that when a card is drawn, instead of having to wait for 20 people to take their turn, a card will be drawn, and then those three people do that action on the card at the same time. So if it says, fight a monster, they all get to fight a monster at the same time. And so hopefully that will you know, improve the playability of it and make it go a little bit quicker for such an actual large-scale project. And um, like I said, there were tons of photos taken over the two-and-a-half-month process of getting this done. So on my, you know, PowerPoint here, I've got the actual slide to our actual uh, Google Photo album that has, I think, a little over 200 photos showing all the locations, all the stuff as we were making monsters, all that kinds of stuff. And as, as I said, I mean, you know, this was a huge project that came out of their idea, you know, and, and we didn't just do this during Teen Read Week. We also did do the t-shirts. We did the character building workshop. They got to see how hard it is to develop a character because they don't see those rules that are going on behind the scenes. <laughs> and, you know, just tons tons of, you know, stuff we ended up doing. You know, we did, like, paper crafts related to Arkham, you know, and monsters and stuff. And they just had a lot of fun. And like I said, we're probably going to end up, you know, doing it again sometime in possibly September uh, right now because they had such a huge fun time doing this, and they got so much publicity, you know, with the life-size Arkham since we were in, interviewed for School Library Journal and everything, and um, a website devoted to Arkham is going to interview us soon, you know, stuff like that. Uh, we actually applied for the Teen Read Week grant again this time uh, for this year, and we'll find out at the end of August if we get it or not to attempt to do a life-size version of life. <laughs> So, so this is definitely kind of like the thing that they're like, we want to make this our thing, doing life-size versions of games. <laughs> so that's, that's basically what we did. So if there's any questions, you know, let me know. All right, great. Wow. Um, I guess I have uh, two questions for you because I, I'm just I'm sitting here with my Cthulhu puppet. Well, before, um, yeah, if anyone has any questions or comments <laughs> or anything for Lindsay or for Gordon, going back to his, please use your um, question section of your GoToWebinar interface and we can pass them on. Mm -hmm. I'm also wearing a Lovecraft t-shirt. And, and, <laughs> um, so, okay, my first question is when are you going to let the adults play? <laughs> if, if, we, if we could get enough adults, sure, you know, I think, I think my teens would volunteer to, 
you know, either play with adults or help set it up for adults. You know, I mean, we, we just had an author event over the summer in June, and one of the authors, he lives in Arizona, but he's from Papillion. And so he was like, I'll come on in, you know, no problem. And so he came in, and he's like, I heard about your life-size Arkham thing. Oh, my God, I wish I still lived here because I would want to do that. <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah, yeah um, I, I'm interested. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, but my, my other question is, is given, given that, and I'm sure being in October helps, but given that this is Lovecraft and, and, you know, the horror and the subject matter, was, was there any complaints from anybody anywhere about, you know, the, the, the subject matter of this game and, and the, the program that you were putting out, putting on? We've actually had no complaints about anything really. I mean, a lot of the, you know, parents that have come in and seen it and everything really focus on, you know, the benefits of such a complex game. You know, they actually see the teamwork as the teams are working together. You know, all the reading that goes on, you know, when they read their encounter cards, the math when they have to figure out, okay, I've got this much of a fight and this monster has this much of a modifier which takes my fight down to this, but oh, I have this card that gives me extra help, you know, there's lots of math going on, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that, that they're very much more focused on that because there are there are some things that, you know, might be considered, you know, more adult themed since, you know, it is, does take place in the 1920s, you know, they're obviously, you know, Hibbs Roadhouse, it's a gangster place, you know, there's alcohol, you know, there's, there's, uh, one example, there's a whiskey card in, you know, the deck that, you know, if you drink your whiskey, it gives you, you know, it makes you luckier because obviously you're drunk and you're more brave, you know, and, and you know, they, they kind of just mm -hmm. understand, you know, it's like the historical context thing, you know, because prohibition was going on at that time, so, you know, the gangsters are hiding all their alcohol, you know, there's, you know, other things like a lucky cigar case, you know, things like that, but, you know, nobody's ever had any problems with any of the adult things or, you know, the monsters, even, you know, the life-size version, I mean, the monsters that the teens were killing, you know, were cute, cuddly little stuffed animals that we just modify. <laughs> so it wasn't anything actually scary or whatnot. And like I said, I mean, my oldest player is Audie, who is 21, and my youngest is Sarah, who is 9. And, you know, the, the biggest problem she has is, you know, not understanding some words when she's reading a card, you know. But otherwise, it's something that appeals to all ages, to both genders, you know, and they have a lot of fun. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Um, any questions from no. the audience? No, nothing coming through. I, I got to say, I, I remember uh, see, seeing some of this, and, and usually when I have folks on, I try not to research what they're doing too much because I want to hear it just like everybody else is hearing it, and just the, the amount of work you put into this uh, and, and the kids put into this is just phenomenal um, and, and looks like uh, tons of fun. And, yeah, definitely keep me in the loop. I, I might be uh, – I'd at least want to see it played, if not play it myself. That, that, that's the darn sure. So, all right. Uh, so nothing coming in from the audience, and, and we're a little over our hour here, so um, I think we'll, we'll kind of uh, wrap it up just a little bit. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Gordon, for that, and Lindsay. Uh, uh, everybody's supplied their contact information. Chris has been uh, bookmarking all of the links and everything uh, that have been coming across. Um, normally, uh, I share some news here, and I think we can just bring that uh, up real quick here. I won't go into it uh, too much, but uh, these links will be available in the show notes. Uh, mostly just uh, three things I've got there. One, uh, using Google as a proxy server if you are having trouble uh, accessing some sites. Um, and then two services uh, kind of either going private or shutting down. I think Christopher for one of these there, uh, the old reader, one of the um, Google reader replacements is going kind of private. So if you have an account there, you may no longer have an account there uh, in a couple of weeks. And then Extra Normal, which is I think a, a site that we've um, shown at least once or twice on, on various episodes that allows you to create uh, cartoon videos uh, online. Uh, they're actually shutting down after being uh, uh, open for about five years uh, coming up in the near future. So if that's a service you use, uh, something you might want to be aware of. So we'll, uh, we'll put links to those in the show notes and mm -hmm. uh, allow everybody to access those and get the, the information that they need on that. Um, so I guess uh, that's it for me in uh, Tech Talk this week. So, uh, Kristen? Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lindsay and Gordon. That was really cool information. Um, I don't know if I caught it, understood a lot of what Gordon was saying about servers. I don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I think it was really good, the basics of it, and 
for me, like not knowing how to set up a server, having all those resources is really great. Um, and then the Lindsay's thing, that just looked like a ton of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much also everyone for attending this week. Um, I hope you'll join us next week at Encompass Live when our topic is Boopsy, which sounds like a lot of fun. Um, it's a, a service to do to create up a mobile app for your library. And um, Louise Alcorn, who is the reference technology librarian at Des Moines, West Des Moines Public Library in Iowa, is going to be on with me. And she's going to talk about how they use Boopsy to create the mobile app for their library. Um, so hopefully you'll join us for that next week. And if you are a um, Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so please do like us there. You'll get notifications from there of when new um, episodes are starting. Like here's a notice of join us right now. We were right before this morning show um, when recordings are, avail are ready to watch. I post the notice up here as well. So if you want to be keep up on what um, Encompass Live is doing um, and you are a big Facebook user, please do go ahead and like us on Facebook. Other than that, we are wrapped up for this morning. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Thank Lindsay, you. Gordon, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.